this is Duke University. I don't remember when I first heard it would be possible to hold state officials criminally accountable for human rights violations. No one mentioned it in 1976 when I lived in Montevideo, Uruguay as a university exchange student. In 1973, the elected president of Uruguay, Juan Maria Bordaberry, and the Uruguay military had overthrown the democratic government, closed down the Congress and the Supreme Court, and started imprisoning and torturing their opponents. Bordaberry continued to serve as president, and his participation gave a veneer of legitimacy to the new authoritarian regime. Once known as the Switzerland of Latin America for its small size, long democratic tradition, and mature social welfare policies, Uruguay quickly gained notoriety as the torture chamber of the Americas. I talked with people in Uruguay who had been imprisoned and tortured. It was hard for them to foresee an end to the dictatorship, and no one imagined that someday it would be possible to judge those responsible for human rights violations and send them to prison. This had long been the political tradition in Latin America, where military coups were a commonplace instrument of politics that leaders would not or could not be judged for their crimes. No one I spoke to in Uruguay mentioned the possibility of prosecuting Bordaberry or the Uruguay military. Bordaberry found that he could, in fact, be the object of judgment. In 2006, a Uruguay judge indicted Bordaberry and his Minister of Foreign Affairs, Juan Carlos Blanco, ordering them into preventive prison to await trial for the murder of Gutierrez Ruiz and Michelini. In 2010, the 81-year-old Bordaberry was convicted and sentenced to 30 years in prison. Other top officials of the dictatorial government, including Blanco and Gregorio Alvarez, the military president, after Bordaberry shared his fate, having since been convicted and sentenced to prison time of 20 and 25 years. The story of Bordaberry is just one of many stories of state officials for whom the unimaginable had occurred. Individual criminal accountability for violations of human rights. These are one, these are pieces of a broader international trend, which is the emergence of a decentralized but interactive system of global accountability for a small core set of human rights violations, mainly uh, war crimes, massacres, uh, genocide, torture, sometimes political imprisonment, disappearance. Um, so we're not talking about prosecutions for a wide range of human rights violations, we're talking prosecutions for a quite narrow range of human rights violations that nevertheless were not subject previously to accountability. You know, so, so what is really, what's new that's happening here? And what's new is not just a move from impunity to accountability, but rather a move to a particular kind of accountability. So uh, we can think that there were you know, three kind of models of accountability. The sovereign immunity model, the pre-World War II model, where virtually state officials were not held accountable for past human rights violations, with very few exceptions to that rule. The Holocaust and World War II pointed to the deep moral and political flaws of this model. And states after World War II crafted a new human rights system. That system used in its entirety, almost in its entirety, what I call the state accountability model, in which states are held accountable using uh, reputation, peer, and legal mechanisms. And so virtually the entire United Nations human rights system, as well as the regional systems in, in Europe and in the Americas, use a state accountability model. Okay? Individuals are not held accountable. No one's sent to prison. Um, this individual criminal accountability is happening at three levels. It's happening, of course, with these international prosecutions that we hear so much about, the uh, tribunals for the former Yugoslavia, the ICTY, the for Rwanda, the ICTR, and of course the International Criminal Court, the ICC. Um, they also involve foreign and transnational prosecutions that are conducted in another country for human rights violations that happened. And the most famous of these, of course, is the Pinochet uh, prosecution in the, uh, uh, in the United Kingdom, uh, where following an arrest warrant from Spain. However, the, the, the bulk 
of this action, the bulk of this trend is actually happening in domestic courts. And that's what usually gets left out of these studies. There's a lot of attention to these high profile international tribunals as if the entire trend rested upon the success and existence of these tribunals. But it turns out when you look at the data that these international tribunals and even the foreign prosecutions are still the backup system to the, uh, the main action which is happening in domestic courts. Now it's very important to have that backup system because in the old days if you wanted to prosecute domestically, uh, state officials could always go into exile and very frequently lived extremely comfortable exiles uh, on in the Riviera or wherever else. And so having the possibility of international and foreign prosecutions means that uh, uh, state officials may feel that as they must stay in their home country where then they are more subject to domestic jurisdiction. What you should be asking yourselves now is, oh yeah, of course, it's going to work in Latin America, but you know, if it's really a justice cascade, if there really is a global trend out there, what about the powerful countries of the world? What about the United States? What about China? Uh, are they also part of the, the, the justice cascade? And I, I do take that up at a whole chapter on the, on the Bush administration non-compliance with torture, and I ask, is the United States immune to the justice cascade? We have had a, a fair amount of low-level military justice court martials uh, for individual soldiers involved in mistreatment of detainees in Guantanamo, Iraq, and Afghanistan. But there has been no accountabil accountability for high level officials in this country. Uh, because of that absence of accountability of high level officials, the possibility of foreign prosecutions opens up in this case, just as it has in most of the other cases in the book. And so I wanted to end with a reading from the US chapter that um, talks about the, the, one of these foreign prosecutions uh, in Italy. Okay, U.S. policymakers are learning the same lesson that Chilean and Argentines previously learned. Internal attempts to protect state officials from prosecution cannot bind the hands of foreign judiciaries. So while the memos and legislation might temporarily protect U.S. officials from domestic prosecution, they cannot necessarily protect them from foreign courts like those in Italy, which became the first courts to convict American citizens for crimes committed as part of the war on terror during the Bush administration. In November 2009, a trial in Italy resulted in convictions in absentia of 23 Americans and two Italians for kidnapping an Egyptian terror suspect off the streets of Milan. An Italian judge decided that what the U.S. government called extraordinary rendition fit the Italian criminal code definition of kidnapping. Milan prosecutor Armando Spataro was the man behind the first major legal blow to the CIA's extraordinary rendition program. The Torture Convention makes it clear that states cannot expel, return, or extradite a person to another state where there are substantial grounds for believing that he would be in danger of being subjected to torture. But the policy of extraordinary rendition, as practiced by the Bush administration, was exactly that. It sent, it sent people to other states with the added complication that these individuals were often cases of being actually kidnapped from one country to another before being sent. To a third. Human rights advocates said that rendition was the CIA's way of outsourcing the torture of suspected terrorists. For Prosecutor Spataro, however, if a man is kidnapped off the streets of Milan, this is a crime that deserves investigation just like any other crime, even if it was committed by the CIA in collaboration with the Italian Secret Service. Spataro started working in the anti-terrorism division of the Milan Prosecutor's Office in 1978 when Italy was beset by internal terrorism of the Red Brigades, whose bombings and murders created chaos and fear around the country. Every time Spataro hears people say, you can't fight terrorism with the law code, he recalls defiantly, we overcame terrorism in Italy using the law. The Bush administration thinks that tribunals are an obstacle to fighting terrorism, Spataro said. We think we need to use the same system, the same methods we use to fight the mafia in Italy. By terrorism, we need the cooperation of the Islamic community in our democratic countries. In order to get their cooperation, we have to demonstrate we are a full democracy and the same rules apply to everyone. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.